Good afternoon, everybody. Today is the 20th of May, the year 2009. My name is Jeff Given, and I'm a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans Histories Project through the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in these conflicts. Today I'm here at the museum with our special guest, Bob Wood, and we have the honor and privilege of interviewing his father-in-law, George Mattis, who was an aircraft mechanic. So today we're going to talk to him about that and a whole lot of other things. It's nice having you here, George. Thank you. Okay, while I adjust the camera here, would you uh, please pronounce your full name and spell it for everyone, please? Yeah, my, my name is George James Mattis. I was born on 26th of November, 1918, in Riverside, California. Okay. And I was born from, uh, with foreign extractions as my parents, my father came from Czechoslovakia, my mother came from Poland. Did they come directly? Uh, my, my dad came uh, in 1898, checked into Ellis Island with a suitcase and a violin case, because in Czechoslovakia he played the violin with the gypsies. They taught him how to play. When all the people coming from that part of the country settled in Alpha, New Jersey, he was playing his violin at a street dance in Alpha, New Jersey, and that's where he met my mother. Okay. She had come from Poland, and uh, he took a liking to her, and eventually got acquainted with her, married her. And, and what was her name? And her name was uh, Mary Anna Grusella. Okay. From Poland. So did they come from? Same basic area of Poland, uh, well, Czechoslovakia. He, uh, it was not too far, because those countries are so close up there. Anyway, you, you back out of the garage, you're a different country sometimes. Uh, right, right. Uh, Did you ever get to know your grandparents? I I never met either one of my grandparents. Uh, my our, my father's uh, father owned a, f a flour mill in Czechoslovakia that was run by a water wheel. Okay. And uh, he used to uh, thrash the, the, the wheat for the people and take a portion of it. And then uh, always on Saturdays, he would take his portion of the flour that he took as his pay into town and, and sell it. Okay. And then he would stay in a beer joint and he would play cards and drink beer. And the reason they came to America is because he lost the, the flour mill in one of his poker games. Oh, mercy. To a person. So the whole family came over here to work, make enough money to buy it back, which they did. And the old people went back, but the young ones always stayed here. Okay. Did they stay, stay in the New York area? Or? Uh, no. My dad, they stayed in, in Jersey, and they got married. My dad had, they had, my mother and dad had five children back there. And of course my mother had to stay home and, and uh, take care of the kids. But my dad continued to play his uh, violin at the street dance on Saturday nights. But the people there, they, they didn't, they don't have a bar at the street dance so nobody can go out and buy a drink. So people brought their own, mm -hmm. and because the countryside is full of crab apple trees, people used to take and fill their rain barrel when it became empty with crab apples, and leave it set outside until the crab apples started to ferment and made uh, apple cider. And if they left it long enough, it, it, it created a little alcohol which they called hard apple cider. And then when the winter came, that whole barrel would freeze, and right in the top of that 55-gallon barrel was a little pocket of stuff that didn't freeze. And that was pure alcohol. And they would dip that out, and they called that Applejack. And that's what they drank at the, at the square at the street end. I bet that set you on fire. And it, sometimes he'd come home a little bit troublesome, 
So my mother kept going to church making a, a prayer, novita, that something would come up to get him out of that environment. And so he got a telegram from the Riverside Cement Plant in 1909 to come out and take over the quarry and do all the dynamiting for that uh, out here because they found out he knew how to handle dynamite. So they sent for him and he came to Riverside in 1909, but because of his accent, the banks wouldn't loan him any money to bring the family out. Now the cement plant only paid one fair. So it took him two years to save up enough money to bring the, the rest of the family, which was the, uh, the three girls and one boy. He had two boys, but one of them had drowned during that two years in a cistern that they had for irrigation on the corner of the street bank. So in 1911, the, the fa rest of the family came out, and then the rest of us that were born later were all born in Riverside. My parents ended up with eight girls and three boys. Can you name them all, please? Yes, there was uh, Annie, Betty, Mary, Joe, Helen, Francis, myself, George, Dorothy, Margaret, Barbara, and Anthony was another baby they had that had passed away in 1911 from ammonia. They didn't have any cures for ammonia in those days. Mm -hmm. So we were all born, raised here, and uh, we got along well. Good. What was your neighborhood we, we, like? We would have our, uh, our skirmishes, but we always got together on weekends. My mother, she spent most of her time cooking, as most of the foreigners did, mm -hmm. and her, one of her main meals was we always had soup, homemade, homemade noodles, a lot of vegetables that she grew in her own garden amongst the flower, and that's the way the, uh, we were brought up. So we were actually brought up pretty healthy with a healthy diet. We very seldom had desserts. Okay. Uh, only if somebody's birthday or something or on Sundays like that. You probably had some kolaches in the morning and things like that. We had hearty meals. Uh, yeah. Now, what was your neighborhood like that you were raised in? Well, uh, we were in, in uh, a regular plain neighborhood. In fact, I only live a block and a half of my mother's house, the one we moved into on Washington's birthday, 1928. And uh, it's kind of a on the edge of town, but it's at the foot of the the mountain here, which people hike up every day. There's droves of people walk up for their health. If you if you get on the road and you go up the road, the up road and the down road, it's a little over four miles if you stay on that road. Which and we have hundreds of people every day going up still today. And uh, in the old days when we first moved there. The roads were not paved. Mm -hmm. It was uh, just granite, an old road. And on the part that I live on was quite a steep hill. And one of the fellows that had a, a little race car, he built himself to coast down the hill. Right. Was Rex Mays, oh. who drove in the Indianapolis race. Oh, mercy sakes. That's where he got killed. As they, and he was just a young kid in those days. So what all did you kids do for fun other than yeah. ride cars down the hill? Yeah. What else did you do for fun? Well, I, other than uh, we, we went to, uh, I used to hike up the hill every day. I'd get up and down in 40 minutes before I went to work. And uh, so it, it worked us. I worked, yeah, during a, uh, before the war, we didn't have any industry in Riverside except oranges. I worked in the orange groves. Okay. And uh, I, I did a lot of, of uh, what they called uh, pest control in the orange groves, where we used to cover the trees with a tent and shoot cyanide gas underneath to kill all the insects and stuff. Do you remember how much you were paid to do that? A cent and a half a tree. 
And if we did 600 trees a night, I got $9. Now that was a good paid job because if I worked in the packing house or the cannery that was hourly, I got 45 cents an hour, which was only three dollars a day. Right, right. So I figured I was in the chips by doing piecework. That was pretty good money for back then. Yeah, it was. Now during the depression, did you were you able to work during the depression? Yeah, that's same same work. Okay. And then later. Uh, I took a job that uh, I worked. I worked for Lockheed for a short time because I, this was before the war, before we got into it. Okay. And uh, Lockheed had a contract to build uh, 240 bombers for England, and so they were recruiting people all over. So I signed up. And they sent me to a school to learn how to rivet. And how old were you at this point? Uh, I was about 19 or 20. Okay. And uh, so I went to riveting school. And after you got learned how to rivet, then they hired you to, to work in the plant. And what year was this? It was, uh, let's see, we weren't in the war. It was about 19, last part of 39, or maybe 40. Well, let's go back a little bit. Did your father lose his job during the Depression? Uh, yes. After he, he worked for the cement plant from 1909 until 19, I think, 1928. And uh, what they did, if you had 20 years in, they, you, they were supposed to retire you. And he had about 18 and a half years in and they did away with his job and they they didn't fire him but they told him they were shutting the quarry down and they wouldn't need him to do the blasting but if he wanted to he could go work in the sack house which was a bunch of hispanics in there and uh, work there for a while and so he was pretty well uh, disturbed with that so he said well let me think it over and he took off to go home for his lunch at quarter to 12. When he came back they told him you quit you went you quit you walked off the job 15 minutes before lunchtime and that's the excuse they used to get rid of it. So he hired a lawyer and he says well they got you over well you can't do much about it. Mercy. So, so was the Depression hard for your family? Yeah, because uh, we had just gotten that house. We moved into the new house in the town. It was on uh, Washington's birthday, 1928. And we got a half day off from school to celebrate. And so we were so happy to be kids because we were able to walk home from school and not have to depend on my oldest brother to pick us up in the Model T. And so we got home and things went around. And then being in town, there were, when we were on the farm, we always had jobs of picking strawberries or beans or something for the neighbors. But I got in town, I got a job selling newspapers on the street. Okay. And. Uh, so papers in those days sold for three cents a copy and we got a penny. Mercy, that's good pay. <laughs> and so if we could sell 20 or 30 papers a night, then we were bringing the money home. And now, did that for quite a while. You mentioned your mother being fairly religious. Did, yes. Was, were you raised in the church? Y yes. And which church was that? And another thing that happened to my mother when she came, she was 10 years old when she came from Poland. And the day they were supposed to leave Poland to go get on the boat was a Polish holiday uh, for the church. It was a, a, a church holiday. And once a year, all the parishioners baked bread to give to the poor. And so my grandmother insisted that she bake the bread to give to the church for the poor, which she did. By doing that, 
they missed the boat. Oh, mercy. The boat they missed sunk, and all people were lost. Wow. And it was called a Trava. It was a German ship. And they came later on steerage, which is on the main deck up you sleep between your trunks and suitcases on the main deck and coming over and that was it. So what church were you raised in? Uh, Catholic. Okay. Yeah. And you went to church when you were a young student? Yeah. Okay. So, oh yeah. Even when, so it, 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 it worked out and, and uh, so I, I thought well you know we were highly disciplined there you know because mm -hmm. those days they wouldn't get away with the stuff they pulled on us in those. Right. But so what schools did you go to there in Riverside? Same one. Same Catholic school. Okay, so you went to the Catholic yeah. high school yeah. too? St. Yeah. Francis. St. Francis? Okay. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, they, when they built the other church and other schools, they, they didn't continue the high school part in our parish, but they still have a school there. Okay, and so St. Francis yeah. Parish as well. And I brought up, I was an altar boy, or an usher, Eucharistic minister, church council. I went through the whole gauntlet of things. So what were some of your favorite subjects in school? Well, I think I like geography. Okay. Yeah, because I used to always like it when we got to that. And of course, I, uh, another thing was I always went out for sports. Okay. What did you play? And I, I, well, we, I played usually, we played baseball, football, basketball. I didn't do well in basketball, but football I was heavy and husky enough to where I could always make a point. You know? And as far as baseball, we played softball. We didn't play much baseball. It was just the, and I could, usually managed to hit a fly right out to center field every time. I never got a run around the pitch. <laughs> so uh, when did you first get an interest in aviation? Well, I got a job after being at Lockheed. We only worked for a few months. And they started you out at 50 cents an hour. And if your work was satisfactory, you got a two cent raise every few weeks. So I worked enough months to get up to 56 cents. Well then, uh, we had completed that contract for Lockheed, so they laid everybody off and says, we'll contact you when we get another contract. And so th at that time, I had, uh, some fellows told me they were hiring out at the American Paddish and Chemical Company out in the, the desert. And I, so I went out there and applied, and they hired me for a job out there. And uh, so they, you just went out and you lived in bachelor uh, quarters, uh, barracks, like, and, and lived right on the plant, and, and which, which I did for a couple of years. In the meantime, Lockheed started calling people back. But I was up to 67 and a half cents out there, so I didn't go back to Lockheed for 56. I didn't do that. Well, at the same time then, it's when I got married. And uh, there wasn't any facilities for a married couple, so I had to rent a place at, at, at Riverside for my wife and go back and forth on weekends. So what year was this? Uh, that was uh, about 19, I think it was February 1940. Okay, and what's your wife's name? Uh, Ruth uh, Mattis. Her last name was Workman. Okay, so where and, did you meet her? Uh, I met her in a parking lot at a dance one night. Okay. And I'd gone to dance with my friend, my buddy, and uh, he had, uh, I, I didn't dance in those days. I was had two left feet. So anyway, after the dance, I was standing by his car and waiting for him to come out. And he came out with this gal, and he had offered him to uh, find out if she wanted to stop for a hamburger or something afterward. And she said, well, she's waiting for a girlfriend that rode with her. 
so when their girlfriend came out, well, that was the gal that they introduced me to. And uh, so we took them all out and got them a, a sandwich. And of course, all we drank was root beer in those days. And, and, uh, so how long did you two date before you so, asked her to marry you? Well, it, uh, I guess we must have gone for a couple of years, you know, before. Because I wasn't quite ready to get married. She kind of had to edge me on a little bit, <laughs> uh, which she did. And we finally, we decided, in fact, when we got married, I was working, I had two jobs. I had one at an olive cannery on the, during the week, and on weekends I was taking care of the, the lawn bowling greens uh, at the park where these do people used to lawn bowl. Okay. And that was an extra job. So she came up to me about noon in her brother's car, because I didn't have a car. And she says, are you getting paid today? I said, I think so. Well, hurry up and finish so we can go. I said, where are we going? She said, we're going to go to Yuma to get married. Said, That's where everybody used to go. That's before Las Vegas took over the marriage, you know. Mm -hmm. So we, she, we drove, I drove her brother's car to Yuma, went down there, we stayed in overnight in, in Mexicali or El Centro and went in and that was Saturday night. Went down and everything was closed Sunday. So we tried to find out, you know, go. So they told me go where the dead judge lived. So we went down, knocked on his door. He says, I asked, asked if he could marry us. Oh, sure, he says. Do uh, you have a license? I said, no, don't you have here? He said, no, you have to go to the Hall of Record. So we went down there. They kept open on Saturday morning. They sold us a license. By the time I came back with the license, I said, well, I got the license. Can you marry? Or he says, you know, I'm kind of in a bind here. He says, my family just went to a movie this afternoon, and I don't have anybody here for witnesses. So I went off the sidewalk and stopped a couple people walking by and they stood as witnesses. <laughs> That's quite and a story. Got, so then when we got home, her father jumped all over me because I kept her out overnight. And then she showed him the marriage certificate. And he didn't believe it. He called up that judge right away to verify that we actually went through with it. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I think, you know, one thing I got in the military was OJT, uh, you know, and, uh, so, and I said, you know, I think my whole education come from OJT, on the job training. Right. Well, let's, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. So where were you on December 7th, 1941? On uh, 1940, I was working at, uh, at Trona on the desert. And that's where the Japanese uh, attack, and I was working there. And so we had already had skirmishes with Germany, because I think Roosevelt at that time had given the order to shoot on sight any German vessels because they had sunk one of our destroyers up in Iceland at mm -hmm. that time. And so he was, he didn't declare war, but he gave the order, shoot on sight. And then when Pearl Harbor was bombed, I was home on a Sunday from my desert job for the weekend, and, uh, and I heard it on the radio. Pearl Harbor had just been attacked and bombed. Okay. And so then I went back and I worked at the... Uh, so what was your reaction when you heard that Pearl Harbor was attacked? Well, I was thinking, gee, you know, I don't know. And then, at the same time, the announcer was saying, all military report to their base. It was early in the morning. And I thought, gee, you know, things are kind of bad. But then I thought, well, I already had a couple kids. I thought, they're not going to call me. 
uh, which they didn't write off. Uh -huh. So anyway, I went back and I worked there, I think, for another year. And then I kept trying to get a job closer to home. And which I finally did. I got a job working for a cement plant in Riverside, the same place my dad worked for years. And they gave me a job because they were running, they didn't have the, the normally, uh, if a person went to the cement plant before that, if you weren't Hispanic, they wouldn't talk to you. But they were running out of, because all those, when they, the war started, most of those uh, people that came illegal headed back to Mexico, so they didn't have enough people to hire. So they hired me. And I worked, I was just a plain old labor called yard, uh, the, I was in the yard gang, which we did everything that needed, anything needed fixing, cleaning up or whatever. We just did whatever they told us. Then later on, the foreman I had there, he took kind of a liking to me. And they had a job come open in the powerhouse because they generated their own power. And he asked me how I'd like to go in there. I said, sure. So he recommended me and they transferred to the powerhouse. That was a pretty good job. And uh, I worked there for quite a while. And then after we got involved in the war, I got a letter from Northern Air Base offered me a job. Well, the first two or three letters I got, I ignored. And then about the fourth letter, I decided, well, you know, I'm out there in that cement plant, breathing that cement dust all day long. I said, maybe I ought to try a different job. So I went over and checked into it. And they says, yeah, we'll give you a job. What do you want to do? I said, well, I'm not sure. And he says, well, we hired you, and we're going to put you in what they call a selection unit. So we, I spent four hours every day in a different department to see what I was adaptable to. And I went through that for the first oh, month or so, all these different. Then when I got through, he said, you're pretty adaptable to a lot of things. He says, you, you made second highest average of anybody who went through this course. He said, what would you like? I said, well, I used to work on my Model T all the time. How about going into engine repair or something like that? He says, well, I have a specialist job that I think you might qualify for. And he said, that's a propeller specialist. Well, I never thought much of propellers on an airplane. That's just spin on. He said, no, that's, that's a precise job that we needed. So I said, OK. So they sent me to school. And I went in to become a propeller mechanic specialist because it was all precision work. And you not only had to adjust the angle of the blade, balance it where one penny will make it turn. You know, and all stuff like that. So I worked out on that. And then they used to send me to all these different bases because they didn't have any propeller mechanic. So I went, tried from Norton to Marchfield, Tucson, and to, uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, where else did I go? Any place that they had a, an airfield, uh, Arizona, Douglas, Arizona, all the, and they had so many problems with propellers due to the fact that these pilots they were training most of the time out in the desert. They once they learned to handle the airplane, they thought they were pretty hot shot, and they would hedgehog across the desert so low. They would pick it up the gravel and throw it back in the airplane behind them, and those propellers were getting all chewed up, and nicked up with that gravel. So I was always had a bunch of work there. In fact, we never could get enough parts for. So I, I like the travel to go here, there, and other places. 
So this was in 1942, 43? Yeah, through that. Well, then, well, yeah, because then, uh, I was living in a house that I had rented in Riverside from the mayor of Riverside at that time. He built the house in 1950. And then when he became mayor, he got a new house. But he, this one he built for his wife as a wedding present. So he rented it out to us, $25 a month. It was a nice house, nice big rooms and everything. So he came over one time and said, I'm going to have to ask you to move. I says, why? He says, I'm putting the house up for sale. I says, well, according to the record now, I says, you have to give me at least six months. He said, no, I don't. He said, I'm a lawyer. I know the law. I said, well, I'm just telling you what I read in the paper, that they can't just evict people that way. Well, he was on the draft board and I got my draft order. So I went down and took the physical. I had three dependents by then. I said, they're not supposed to draft me, an old man. I was 23 years old, they're not supposed to draft an old man with three kids, but they did. So I went down to Los Angeles through the selection agency. They gave me my physical, and when I got through, he asked me, he says, well, you passed your physical, okay? He says, where are we going to put you? I says, I'd like to go to the Air Force. He says, they're full up, we can't take you. I said, give me the Navy then. He, he says, you look like you'd make a good Marine. I said, not if I can help it. <laughs> so anyway, I had to go through a couple more tests. And when I got back, he said, oh, yeah, there you are. Now, where are you going to go? I said, you told me you're putting me in the Navy. They stepped a baby, and that's where I went. So what did you get sent in? What was your first job to do? Or where did you go to training first? Let's uh, start there. San Diego. And how? It was ten weeks. Ten weeks in boot yeah. camp. And uh, we had a couple of celebrities in there, you know. And when I finished my ten weeks, I got to go home for two weeks, and then go back for assignment. Well, who were the celebrities in your training? And. Uh, well, what was happening, they told me Gene Kelly had just got drafted, a tap dancer. So I got, I volunteered for a job to go through all the barracks and change the light bulbs. And I went through his barracks, I didn't see him, <laughs> he wasn't there. And, uh, anyway, most of the, those celebrities, they were, they, they brought them, but they pulled them right up. And then, I think, uh, some of the others that went in the Air Force, James Stewart and Clark Gable, and them, they became pilots, you know, and actually did their job. But uh, I just went through that basic, and I waited, and then I was waiting for assignment. I sat around the base there for a couple of weeks. And then a ship came in to North Island, and they called me, pack your bags, you're going out. I packed my bags, get in that whale over there. They took me across the bay, put me on the ship, the Ranger, USS Ranger. So you had been assigned as, um, you were just right out of boot camp? And well, it, that was, yeah. Right and were you trained for a special job or anything? No, well, they asked me if I wanted to be an armor, armament. And I says, well, I did a little bit of aircraft work. So then they said, okay, uh, we're going to assign you the aircraft carrier. So I went at the Air Division on the U.S. Ranger. And uh, so anyway, when I went aboard, they signed me to the Air Division. Next morning, got up and all I did was whatever the chief told us to. And then finally, a little later, we had a squadron of pilots come aboard and they assigned me one airplane. They said, all you have to do is keep this aircraft in flying condition. What kind of an aircraft was it? Uh, it was an AT-6. Okay. It was a Navy plane. It was slow. So I said, okay. 
So anyway, they called flight quarters, and I told the guy, I says, you know, I never been checked out on this before. He says, when they call flight quarters, get in and, and I'll get on the wing and check you through. So flight quarters sounded, I run up, got in that airplane, waited, the guy never showed up. And that guy up in the cronac, he said, get that K-14 starter, what's the matter with that K-14? That was my airplane. So I thought, well, I got to do something. So I start priming the thing and turn the mags on and hit that starter because they had those shotgun starters in the airplane. It kicked over, over primed it, and gasoline was burning all over underneath. So I gunned it and finally the guys were running up with a fire extinguisher. So I blew it out before they got there. So, so you had started engines before then? Well, I, I a little bit I watched, but. So I started that, and I sat there and let it just idle until, and I figured, well, it got hot enough, the oil pressure dropped, so I knew it was warmed up. Uh, and all I did was check the bags, the right bag, the left bag, and I pulled a rivet and changed the pitch of the propeller, and that was all. I looked at the hydraulic pressure on the gauge, and I figured that would, and that's all I knew. So, Pilot came out, he said, you the mechanic on this plane? I said, yes sir. How did it check out? I said, fine, right on the money. Great, how's the manifold pressure? Fine, I didn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I sweated that flight out. I thought, boy, if he falls in the water, and I told him I that the manifold pressure was good. But he made a good flight, came back, and, when I took over again, after we secured that aircraft, I went down to the ship's library, got a book to find out what I was supposed to do. Eventually, I got efficient enough to where I was teaching the other people. You know, so. so you didn't have any training on how to become an aircraft mechanic? No, uh, we'd start an airplane now and then. And then we, uh, we had uh, quite a few new pilot and see what we were doing, we were patrolling up and down the coast of California. And we had to go, the Saratoga, which was a, a carrier older than us, uh, had taken a torpedo off of San Francisco and had to go to dry dock. So we had to relieve it and its patrols. And about the furthest we got in the ocean was to Hawaii. And the rest of the time, close to the coast. And they were sending us all these pilots from uh, Great Lake Training Station. And while we were patrolling, we were also qualifying them for carrier landing because the swells and the ocean are so much deeper than on the Great Lakes. Now, isn't an AT-6 a training plane? Yeah. Isn't the AT-6 a plane that they use for training? Yeah. They, okay. Anyway. Uh, we did a lot of patrolling, and our ship, the Ranger, was the first carrier built from keel up. It was designed on paper and built. All the other carriers prior to that were converted cruisers or battleship hull or whatever, and so ours, so ours was what they called a super carrier, they thought. Hoover had Congress appropriate $4 million to build that big carrier. And uh, it was in 1930. It was commissioned in 1934, and they had so much overrun on the changes because not only the Navy made changes, but so did the shipbuilders. They weren't familiar with building carriers. So they had to make a lot, and I think. So in order to justify the over cost, they set our ship to practically every war zone in order to make a history. And I, before I went aboard, the ship had gone to the invasion of Normandy. They launched the aircraft off of the deck of our ship they went in, strafed the beach, and landed on into France. 
And see, the reason they had to do that, we were so far away from the beach that they launched the aircraft, they went in on the invasion, strafed the beach. Our ship had to turn around and come back, and they said if we would have waited for our aircraft to come back, we might have been too far away from them to have enough gas to make it. So they landed into uh, France. And then at that time, uh, one of the German submarines had uh, fired two torpedoes at the ship. And if we would have continued in the same uh, way we were going, they'd have his broadside, but they saw it coming, so they headed into it. And they both went, one of them uh, exploded near the bow and put a big uh, crack in the bow, but it wasn't enough to do much damage. I mean, they were able to limp into dry dock and get that welded up because all the compartments on the front of the ship were sealed off, so you could close off that apartment. It would it would flood, but it didn't sink the ship and it got back. So then they loaded the ship up with uh, 100 P-38s still in the crates. And they took them to North Africa and unloaded them on the uh, docks of Tunisia. Okay. And they left the P-38s there. And those Arabs over there, when they saw the sailors, they asked, you, got, you want to make business? They want to make business. They want to buy anything you had. So the guys took and they stripped the ship's floor out of all the hair tonics and everything else they had there, and shave cream. And they sold it to those Arabs, they, they gave them good money. And the guys even sold their mattress covers, which the Arabs cut a neck and a sleeve and they wear them because the mattress covers were like a big bag, you know, mm -hmm. at the time. And so then they got the rumor that the ship was going back with another load to North Africa. And that was about when they, Saratoga took the uh, torpedo, and that's when they come on the to the west coast. And that's when I went aboard when they come back. So how long did you serve on her? I was uh, about 13 months, I think. And then they, uh, we, we had, uh, I, I think we were pretty well blessed because the, uh, we were making a thing, but we didn't want to endanger that ship. And then, of course, when the war really started, our ship was small. And uh, they came out. The next ship they built was the Essex class, which was a lot larger than ours. And they start building those. And I went aboard a couple of those ships, and I thought, gee whiz, we're like an escort. Then they had a whole bunch of those escort carriers they called Kaiser Coffin, because they were so short. But they they were efficient because being so small, they could get up enough speed to where they could land an aircraft. But they had to be going so fast before the aircraft would not run over the front. Mm -hmm. And we had a few of them bumps over, but. Uh, our ship was designed to go 35 knots, but by the time I went aboard, we about the top we could get out of was 33. And then it would crack, rattle and roll at that storm. And then I'd be on the flight deck, and we'd be in a heavy sea, that ship going, it was 800 feet long. And I'd watch those expansion joints on the flight deck move about this far, you know. And they had four of them that deck and I thought this thing's going to break in half before we got out of the store. But I guess they, they did a good job. Did you ever get seasick? Uh -huh. Did you ever get seasick? No. Because I always had a good appetite, I guess coming from a Polish family. But see, when it was so many of us kids, when we were home, our conversation at, and when we go to eat, I mean, all the family get that, would say, are you going to eat that? <laughs> So, um, how was the living conditions on the ship? Uh, we had it good uh, on our ship. We had three bunks, so and I was in the middle one, so I had it good. And nobody wanted the bottom one because the blowers that came in to bring the air from the top side, 
they, they would about this far from the deck on the bottom and then spread that lower. If you want that bottom deck, you were in the draft all the time. So everybody wanted the middle or top. So very few of the lower bunks going. In our compartment, we were right at the water line. Our compartment was, the water line was halfway. And above that was above the water line and the other part was below. And uh, it was pretty good. The only thing is we get in a storm, nobody ever had a, enough forethought to tie the garbage cans down. Otherwise it slide back and forth all night long. And everybody, you hear them cussing it out, but they never get up and tie it. <laughs> <laughs> So is the food pretty good? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We ate pretty well at times. And uh, the uh, by me going in at the time I did, which was late, a lot of the people they had picked up, because they were kind of scraping the bottle and barrel at that, that time. All the young kids were taken off and training to pilot school. We got a few guys that off the street, the alcoholics and stuff, and we'd get out the, on the ship for 30 days, and then without a drink, they even drank the, uh, the alcohol out of their torpedoes because they had great alcohol to propel the torpedo. And then they had those some of those other containers that had that created. And then they'd take uh, and buy all the hair tonic out of the ship store and strain it through a loaf of bread and drink the alcohol out of that. Anything. To, they were so desperate for a drink. I thought, boy, they had to get that far off. I'm surprised they didn't go blind drinking that alcohol. Well, I don't know. They sent them to, they sent them to the hospital and they hit shore, a lot of them. They figured they, they weren't of any help when they were in such dire need of a drink that he couldn't depend on them. So what rank were you at this point? Well, I was uh, what they call a third class machinist rate. And that's when I got out. So. Now did you stay with that same aircraft all the time? I stayed, yeah, until and when the war was over, we went back through the canal and up the Mississippi River to New Orleans for Navy Day celebration. And we followed the Mississippi battleship up there. And they donated the battleship Mississippi to the state of Mississippi as the memorial. And our ship was there. And then uh, I, that's where I left the ship, was in New Orleans, at Lake, Lake Pontchartrain's Naval Air Station. I got on the train and came back. But I heard that our ship, all it did when it left New Orleans, it went around to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, went into the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and they were refitted the galley with all stainless steel, where, because they had a pending contract, and, and they had to make sure it was completed before they could do it. Once they got the ship all completed, everything, they took it across the bay to Delaware and scrapped it. And, and later on, they'd come out with a new Ranger, which was a big one. You know. Right, right. I never seen that one. I went aboard the, went aboard the Nimitz so, a while back when it was in Long Beach. And that thing was so big compared to us. But yeah, even though we, uh, our ship was excessive, it, spent, it, was a, it was a teaching. It taught the pilots a lot of things about the way the carriers were one thing, they have it. See, we used to bring the aircraft in, they'd land, the tail hook would catch it, then we'd tax him up to the front of the flight deck. And then, of course, we had the barriers, you know, mm -hmm. but we've had a few accidents where they'd come in, hit the deck, bounce over that barrier, and pick him back on a, another aircraft. We've had him cut the the headrest, while the pilot was still in there, the propeller was sure that headrest. Luck it didn't hit him in the head. And, I mean, things were close. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and then the the resting gears weren't always 
And then the aircraft was getting faster, and we got this Curtis aircraft that what they call monocoque construction, which didn't have any ribs in it. It got its strength like a tin can from the curvature of the metal. But it was so light and fast, but when the tail hook could hit, sometimes it would break in half, and the pilot would be sitting in the back half, and the rest there went hit the barrier. Uh, things like that. And so, uh, and I think by doing that and finding out all the hazards that when they start building these big carriers, the deck was on an angle and the aircraft wasn't parked up in front, it was on the side and stuff, so they eliminated all that. So what happened after you left the ship in Lake Pontchartrain? Well, they, uh, I went back home, took two weeks off, and I went back to the base, uh, Norton Air Base, and uh, I worked there. So you were released out of the Navy? Yeah, and I worked in my old job in, in a uh, propeller shop, but a lot of the, by that time, they had a, quite a few mechanics trained, and uh, they would, now and then, would send me out to different places uh, that they, uh, when the war was over, they had the kind of a Cold War. And we had aircraft that made force landings in different countries, and they would have to send a civilian crew out to repair and get it out of there because if they sent military, the country would holler invasion. So it's a lot of politics and things, you know, like that. So, in fact, we had one that goes down in Antarctica, broke the propellers and the landing gear, and they signed me up to go down there and help repair it, get it out. They say the ice in Antarctica is about 20 feet thick, and it's so clear that you don't judge where the top of the ice is and the, you see the water below it. And a lot of those aircraft, they, they'd hit the ground before they even realized they were down that far. and crack the landing gears and propellers. But I never got to make that. They found a GI in New Zealand who could do the same work I was doing, so they sent him. He was closer. But uh, they sent me to a few things. And then from the propeller shop, they sent me into a, what they call hydrostatics, where I worked with compressed gases and stuff. And I did that for a while. And then from that, they had put me in supply, and I worked as supply on the base, because they were cut back. And so... What I year was went, this? I, oh, it was probably... Uh, in the 60s or something like that. And then from, I was working supply for a while, and then uh, from that, they uh, needed somebody to fill in at the, uh, our, uh, they moved the, uh, the, the, the movie, company from uh, St. Louis, uh, film library and all that, to Norton, and we were making uh, training films. And so they transferred me into that job, and I was there, and I was in charge of what they called the key punchers. Computers were all by key punch cards in those days. Right. And I had a bunch of these women that was doing all the key punchers have to oversee that. And then I was making up a, uh, I guess, kind of a directory book with all the contractors and their uh, codes that they had to where they could order stuff or we could order stuff from them by just going on the computer. And they had the cost center code and all that. So that worked out pretty good. It's kind of an easy job that way. Mm -hmm. I, but I had to finally learn, and then, because I had worked on that, the, that job of procuring 
supplies and everything for the audiovisual, that's what it was, and we were making these, these films. I played in a lot of, uh, of training films, but they never saw my face. It was either holding a phone and says, telephones have big ears, watch security, or the back of my head, holding the car paper, car, destroy all carbons, and stuff like that, it's more or less. And so I said, uh, I said I was a big star from the back of my head. But <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I did that, and then eventually my name come up on a computer to go into a special projects. And I went over, got interviewed, there were five five people we went in to be interviewed for this what they call special project. Well, why don't we stop right there because we're almost out of tape because it sounds like this is going to be a good story and I don't want to miss it on changing tape. So hold it. Okay, so you were one of five people to be called in for we a special went project. For interview. And out of the five, I was the one that was picked for the job. Okay. Can you so tell us what that was? I, uh, I went in to the special services, and then I had to be loaned out to a different department while they investigated me for top secret. Mm -hmm. And so once we got into, after six months, they cleared me for it. I went into this special project. And, uh, we were supporting a lot of security areas, and in fact, uh, I would go to work in the morning, and I was on the computer a lot, ordering stuff. Colonel would come in and says, how is your time today? I fine. Can you take a couple hours off? I said, yeah. Okay, get on that C-130 out there and go out to the area. I get on the C-130, we fly out to Area 51. And take one hour from Norton Base to Area 51, we'd fly out there and we'd land. As soon as we'd land, the airplane stop right in the middle of the runway and they'd send a staff car out, identify us, and then take us in to see the other uh, wherever we had to do our job because, see, I was ordering special stuff for them and uh, a lot of it was classified and things that uh, sometimes they, they would ask me to uh, get some certain part to, to use out there and they didn't want to have any connection with the, uh, the Air Force or our project. So I'd go out and find out what it was they wanted. They'd buy me a schematic. And I would take that part down to some foundry or wherever it was to be built or electronic place and ask if they could build this for me. And so, yeah, I think so. Then what's it for? I said, oh, I've just bought a bunch of surplus stuff. I'm trying to get to work. I said, that's all I do. I'll give them the answer. And I'd buy that, and then our security man that was assigned to us from Washington would give me the cash money to pay him off, and that way I didn't have to, they didn't have to show any connection. And then I also, uh, all the mail that we mailed from the base, it didn't come to the base, it came to our security man, post box. Now that was usually around close to either Highland or Colton or someplace, one of the other post offices. And I would have to take that mail and pick up the other mail and sign for what we sent and sign for what we brought back. You know. So there was always a closed record. And then if we had to take stuff and have it transported, any information, they would give me Yes. And 
and I go down, and there was a place and by the airport called West Coast Security, and they had all this uh, communication and stuff that was all run on uh, cryptograph and stuff like that was where you couldn't decipher it. And they would send our messages, and I'd have to take the the, the stuff down and check in to West Coast Security. And they, you go in, and you'd have to go into a uh, an entrapment area, and then they would lock you in where you couldn't get out, couldn't get up, and then they would look at you with the TV camera. If they recognize you, then they'd let you on in, and then you'd you'd pick up whatever they had and take back what they had. And everything was always double envelope and taped all over so you, you couldn't contaminate, dig into any of them. And then we always had to take our own car and a lot of times uh, I would ride with a, we had a, a GI, a black GI, and we'd use his car and I would ride shotgun with him. And we'd go down there and take all that classified stuff. And we'd have to drive right from north to clear down. It couldn't stop along the way or anything. Just had to be there. But in case something would happen, and all the stuff we had to keep locked in the truck, take it out, unload it, and they would take care of it. And we'd pick up what had to come back. So we got kind of well acquainted with those people down there, but they were so hush-hush about everything. Every now and then, if we had a celebrating a Christmas party or something at our base, we would invite those people that we knew, and they'd come up to Norton and kind of get a, keep in touch with us there on the, on the side, you know, so they kept knew who we were. But they were so secretive. Then once in a while, I would have to go to Washington, and uh, those people there, they thought because they were in Washington, they, they wouldn't totally look at you any place. And uh, I'd have to check in at Richmond, and then go to Fort Bolivar, and we had uh, a lot of information coming in at Fort Bolivar that we were supporting from California and go out there and check in. And we had, uh, we had satellites that was sending our information to us. We had one that was giving us information from China that was over Alice Springs, Austria, Australia. And instead of sending the message right down to the ground or to us, it would go from that satellite to another satellite over the Canary Island, and then that satellite would beam it down to Fort Bolivar. And it was all this classified stuff. And then in order to keep anybody from snooping, when it came out of the, uh, the computer, printer, it came out, because a lot of these were pictures that were taken from our satellite, and I used to have to order uh, 4,800 capacitors that fit on a board about this long, about that wide, and each one of those capacitors would send a beam, and that would go through the clouds and everything, and we could take pictures with that, then it had to hit the ground and bounce back up and it form an image on infrared film. Now that's the way they got to the pictures they wanted. And so, uh, anyway, the, the, when we go down there, they would hire these little kids, and when they came out of the printer, that it was like a big slide, you know. And uh, they were little, black kids. They weren't too bright, but they give them a summer job. And all they had to do was take this film from here, put it in a sleeve, and put it in a pigeonhole here. 
a lot of different places, like SAC headquarters, Pendigal, that way. And that way they figured that was the best security we had, because they, they didn't know what they were handling anyway. Mm -hmm. And it worked out well. And that, uh, So this must have been about in the 70s then? Yeah, it was during the Cold War, you know. And then, uh, yeah, I was, yeah, because it was like, then a lot of times, uh, see, we did, we, we had on our computers at the base, we had to put filters on. Another thing, when we had the key punchers punching in something, they go to key punch card, it had to go through this filter so nobody else could zero in. A couple times we saw a camper parked outside the base, right on the corner where all our telephone lines came into the base. And they had this big dish. Like we don't know where they were, but anyway, we, had to, we, we got them to move because we didn't know where they were trying to latch on to messages and stuff. But they could do that with the. So it was quite a job just keeping everything under cover. So, I bet. Yeah. So how many years in total did you do these secret things? Well, I did that. I retired in 84. And the reason I retired is uh, I, I liked my job, but I was getting to where they just keep me on a computer all the time and no, no, no travel anymore, no schools, no that. Not, See, I used to go to school an awful lot, especially Sheffield Air Base was a training base. And, uh, so you must have retired with a pretty heavy civilian ranking then. I was a GS-11. And uh, of course, if to when I retired, my pay was only around 30000 a year or something like that. It wasn't much. But then I got cost of living and stuff. And I, Tell them, well, I said, you know, things uh, kind of, well, I, they, things kind of look up. And they, people ask me now, they say, oh, you must be making a lot of money. I said, well, yeah, I can eat meat now and then. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you do after you retired? Did you just kind of take things well, easy? Well, I kind of took it easy. Uh, I did a lot of square dancing after I retired. Of course, my wife, she had passed away just before I retired. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, so, and my kids were getting up to where, you know, they were on their own. They were married. My boy went into service. And well, speaking of kids, how many did you have and what are their names? And, and they, uh, how many children did you have and what are their names? Three. And two girls and a boy. What are their names? And, uh, Sandy, Gary, and Bobby, or Barbara, and uh, my boy got electrocuted on construction. He decided, he worked for the phone company, and then we used to go out and work on weekends, because he used to, uh, when they were, all this building was going on, by the time he got out of it, he'd come down here to Palm Springs, and he, they would be putting up grape stake fences around the new buildings. So he had bid on the labor, and the super group had the contract for material. And then because a lot of them were in the sand dunes out here, we'd have to put a, a fence up and zigzag it so it wouldn't blow over. And so he started doing contracts for that, and it was paying off pretty well because we could do about six houses in a weekend. You know? and so he thought, well, you know, that was paying him better than his uh, phone job. He was a field engineer at a phone company. So he decided he was going to go into contracting full time, which he started. And he just did, added a room on a house in Rialto. And the fellow that had the room put on asked if he could put a, a, a blower vent in the ceiling. He says, yeah. So he was installed that blower in the ceiling and wired it up temporarily. And he was up in the attic and uh, he told the 
fellow that worked with him, he said, throw that switch down, I want to make sure this turns the right way. And when the kid threw the switch, he didn't realize it was 107 that day and he was perspiring a lot. He was leaning up against the housing of that blower and it shorted out. It went through here, and crossed his heart and down his leg and this leg was over a pipe that was grounded. Electrocuted him in the attic there. So he had just turned 30 years old when that happened. Mm. His birthday was on the 26th of July and this was the 3rd of August when he got electrocuted. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, so he had, he had three kids. And then uh, since then, his wife is remarried. Uh, between them, they have one more, but they're all growing now. So how many grandchildren do you have? Twelve. Twelve. And any great-grandchildren? Yeah, I think, uh, what do we have? Uh, four? Jeremy, five. huh? Five. Five. Yeah, five because of uh, Marcus. Oh, that's right. Yeah, got six on the way. Yeah, his daughter just had another one though. And, and, and you're, you're forgetting Ray's, Ray's kids too. Yeah. Then you have the two others. Um, uh, Ray's daughter's kid, boy, the boy and girl. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So that makes. Yeah, so I mean, seven, you know, seven, seven, you come eight. from a big family, you always like a lot of people around. So. Yeah. so of all this experience of what you went through during World War II and all the years working for the government, did you learn anything that you'd like to pass on to your family or do you think it Well, uh, most when they asked me that, I said, stick together. And I said, don't, don't hold a grudge because if you do that, I said, it eats you worse than it does them. And I thought, you know, because we did that, and I think in a, in a long run, my dad, he always had a sense of humor. And if anybody was trying to hold a grudge or something, he would make fun of them. And they found out how silly it was. <laughs> and he'd come out of it. And so I thought, well, that worked out well. And, uh, the only thing, we didn't follow his music. I thought well, somebody should have. My, my son, the one that died, he took up the, the trombone in the, uh, uh, in the school band. And he was, got to where he played pretty well. And uh, yeah, he used to like to play that. And only thing I did, I bugled for the Boy Scout. I didn't have any any valves to push on a bugle. It's just yeah. Well, George, I sure appreciate you sharing your history with us. Well, it, they say I talk too much, so I never know when to shut up. <laughs> Did he skip anything that's major? Important? What about when you worked on the missile sites? Well, that was when on was those. That, yeah. uh, that was part of what I said, but I didn't tell him visiting the missile sites. Of course, I had to visit a lot of them. We went uh, along the missile sites up out of Denver and Cheyenne along the border. And uh, they, so, uh, down in Roswell, New Mexico, we had missiles all over and even little ones along the coast you know, we'd work on. But it was uh, going there and Mostly, uh, when we worked on the missiles, it depend on what kind it was. Uh, if it was on the Titan, uh, that was launched by uh, JP-4 and liquid oxygen. And the thing, that fire came out like a cotton torch. And that's the reason when you see a missile take off and you see all that smoke, it is a smoke, it's steam that is created because they have to flood everything underneath to keep it from burning up. And we go there and... Uh, Do you ever get to see one launch? I've, I've never been there when they launched. I've been there up at Edwards when they'd fire the engines to chest them out. Boy, those things had so much thrust they'd 
vibrate that whole mountainside. But they were bolted down, and then they'd shoot that fire down into a deflecting bucket and then shoot it out over the canyon so it went into space. But at the same time, it was all flooded to keep from wel melting. And, uh, so when you were doing the missile sites, you were ordering special parts for them and things like that? Uh, whatever, yeah. And sometimes I'd have to work on the, on the missiles. And uh, when I was working in this hydrostatic job, which was, we, I would have to go in. And because that missile was so sensitive, and with the liquid oxygen, we would have to flush the, the plumbing with the, we used to flush it with uh, refrigerant 13. And that was, it. It, we could flush that refrigerant through the whole system and it would go through and clean it out, but when it dried, it didn't leave any residue of anything. Because even a thumb pin in the wrong place, and that liquid oxygen get on there is a fire hazard because it's got oil in it. Wow. And that was real touchy, that. And well, I got to ask the question. Everybody's going to ask the question. Did you see any aliens at Area 51? No. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I, I said was outstanding there is the contractor they had working out there. We went into their mess hall, and they fed you a good meal. They give you, in the same way when I had to go on Johnson Island, because we had stuff out there, and we had Holmes and Arbor, who was a contractor, and they ran the mess hall. And you go on Thursday, that was steak night. So they gave you two great big T-boat steaks. And if you went for seconds, they gave you two more. <laughs> and, I, and I was out there, I gained 17 pounds while I was on Johnson Island from the way they fed it and everything. And I was there over Christmas and New Year's, so we had a big party. Because they, they, they had such a hard time keeping people out there to work. That's, they didn't mind working for a couple months, but they didn't want to stay. So then all of the, uh, they hired a lot, a lot of these people from Hawaii and Samoa and stuff like that to work out there as laborers. And what they did, they charged them, I think, $2 a day for their meal. And then if they stayed the whole year, they gave them all they paid for their meal back as a bonus. And that was the incentive. And we had some people from the Philippines. We had a houseboy out there, a little bitty guy, cleaned our apartment. His name was Geronimo. <laughs> and I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, I go see my wife once a year. I said, so she wanted me. Well, she lived with my parents. She said, she put money away. By the time I come back, we're going to have seven houses for rent. You know? So I mean, they, they decide what they want to do, and that's the way they, they live up to it. And they come out ahead that way. One thing he found was somebody on Johnson Island had left a popcorn popper, one that you crank, and he found that and he brought it over and said, what is this thing for? <laughs> so I told him what it for. Well, he didn't know what popcorn was. So, and I says, you ought to keep that. And he said, oh, you take it. And I said, no, I don't need it. I, said, I, I think I finally gave it to somebody. <laughs> it was, they get things, of course, on, they, they, uh, the store on Johnson Island was like being overseas. Most of the guys, when they came back from there, they brought scotch. Because you could get uh, scotch, a dollar and a quarter a bottle, fifth. And it was a good scotch, you know, Chevis Regal and stuff like that. And <laughs> Is there anything else that you forgot to tell us? Um, he was in the reserves. You never told him what your Indian rank was in the service. About the what? What your rank was in the service when you finally got done. Well, no, during the, uh, when I came back to Riverside, I joined National Guard because we didn't have a Navy Reserve. And uh, so I stayed and I had a full-time job with National Guard. So I was doing the paperwork, payroll, everything. 
and that was a nice job. And I only had to drill with them once a week and go to camp two weeks out of the year. Did that. I did that for two or three years. Well, let's see. Yeah, I was 47. Yeah, I was 50. I go to scout, uh, National Guard camp. And they used me an awful lot because I was full time as an instructor. And uh, the only thing I didn't like about it, my classes were two hours, so that was a little too long. And I'd be uh, instructing, and first thing you know, I'd be repeating myself, or then I'd look at the people, and they were looking at the ceiling or dozing off and everything. So I'd have to do things to make, make them pay attention. So about the time that would happen, I would misquote one of my sentences that I was saying. I knew they knew the answer. And then when I do that, I said, oh, damn, there I go again. I said, I've had that trouble ever since my dad still blew up. And they all come and wake up <laughs> to want to hear more. <laughs> so then over the years, I kept having to add to that, uh, still blowing up, and, but I kept their attention that way by getting something, because they're always wanting to hear something detrimental rather than... So would you retire and rank in there? And so I stayed, and then when the Korean War came, I went over, and they were sending the 40th Division to Japan, the training, and we went up to Camp Cook, which is now Vandenberg. We trained all the draftees. Then we came back, and I was scheduled to go with them. But about that time, they changed Secretary of Defense. The old one went off, and the one that had been there before had come back. And he said, any person with three or more dependents does not have to go overseas. And I had just re-upped for four more years. So they didn't want to let me go. But then I said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, about that time, one of these colonels stuck his head in the back door when I was giving a class, and I pulled that, oh, my dad still blew up the thing. And he came up to me afterward. He said, Damn it, Mattis. He said, what the hell's the matter with you? Why didn't you take a commission? I said, I didn't have the education for it. He said, like hell, he says, you keep these guys awake better than any instructor I've ever seen. He said, I'm going to send you in to be boarded. So they sent me to Los Angeles, they reported the board, they gave me a commission. But by that time, the 40th Division was already going over, and I was here, so they transferred me into the regular Army Reserve then. And so I just had to be public information officer for the 40th Division, and I go to work at my own office and sit and just answer a bunch of foolish questions. A couple times I'd have to go give a history of our division uh, over the radio at our town talks and stuff like that. And so you were a lieutenant? It was all right. And then when I, the, the National Guard came back, I liked the caliber more of the regular army then I did the National Guard, so I just remained there. And I figured here, for a person that wanted nothing to do with military, I ended up for 35 years. Mercy uh, sake. Counting, counting a reserve and regular and everything else. So what would you retire as? A uh, lieutenant colonel. Wow! And the reason I kept the rank is because my civilian job was half military and half there. And every time somebody start well, wanting to know, especially if I bought something from the BX military, I have these some of these uh, people that say, "Where'd you get those shoes?" I said, oh, "I bought them at the at the BX. Why? Are you allowed to buy stuff there?" I said, "I don't know. They sold it to me. I didn't tell them. I hadn't. the colonel knew that the one that was ahead of the project, but these other people." And then they'd go over there and say, well, you're not supposed to do that. I'm going to report you. I said, oh, boy. I said, is that no kind of thing? Finally, when they got too far out of line, I'd pull my ID card. I 
I had one captain just to give me a lot of time. Pull, and I was a major at that time. I says, Captain, next time I come in here, you give me a high ball first. There's my rank. But next morning I come in, good morning, sir. How are you, sir? This, that. <laughs> if I would have known, I would have introduced you as Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, and, uh, they, they did. Uh, one time we were eating on the officers club and I took a bunch of women with me because this one gal, we used to go in her station wagon and take about six of it. And I said, you want to eat the officers club today? Yeah, yeah, because that was kind of a no-no for our group. Oh, yeah, I'll go over. I'll, Thank you. So we went over and we got our meal. And these people that worked in our project were officers. They say, I know you're eating in the officers club. Are you allowed to do that? I said, I don't know. And then they get kind of there. And then finally, I thought, well, I said, we got to leave it. So the next time I went, I took one of the girls and I told her, I said, pretend you're going to the restroom. But I said, instead of going to the restroom, go by the receptionist desk up there and ask her to page Colonel Mattis that you have a phone call up for him. And I was sitting back there. And so she did, and it come over the lounge. Colonel Mattis, Colonel Mattis, you have a phone call. Uh, receptionist asked Colonel Mattis. <laughs> and everybody was looking. I went up you know, and pretended I was going to answer the phone. And then when I got back to our back our, our project, I told I told the colonel, my real colonel, I wonder what had happened. You know, he says, "Yeah, yeah." He says, "You're always pulling some." <laughs> then later on, somebody come up to me, and I don't know, a day or two later, he says, "You know what happened to you?" I said, "What?" He says, "Those people think that you were sent here from Washington to undercover to see if we we're doing our job right." <laughs> <laughs> I thought the rumor started going, and I didn't let it go. But uh, finally, I, uh, I think started. you inherited. Some, I think you inherited some of your father's uh, humor. Yeah, I guess because uh, he he used to always make fun of things, and and see, in our family, he always had. A nickname for practically all of us. Kind of half Polish, half that. See, my oldest sister, Annie, was named Hunchka. And then my next sister, Mary, was Melina. And then my third sister, was Betty, was the Lizzie. And then my brother, Joe, was Joschko. And then my, my next brother, Johnny, was named Yanko. And see, Janko, or Jan Oshik, in Slovak, he was the Robin Hood of Czechoslovakia. And he was, they did that, and I have the movie of him at home, uh, Jan Oshik, it's all in Slovak. Do you still speak that? I can pick it up when I hear enough of it, you know. Mm -hmm. so. But it, uh, it worked out good. Well, once again, we really appreciate you sharing your story with us. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for well, visiting. Well, thank you. All right. Uh, get my extra legs here. You know, people open doors for me.